Good evening, Dr. George Westlake from Shield Family Life Center in Kansas City, Missouri, and this is Living Answers for Today. I'm here to answer questions about the Word of God to help with problems that you might be facing in the Christian life. And if you don't know Jesus Christ, to let you know that he himself is the answer to the complex problems you face today. Christianity is not just a religion, it's a relationship. The Bible says he that has the Son has life, and he that doesn't have the Son does not have life. The Bible says as many as receive him, he gives power to become the children of God. Jesus Christ is alive and well, and he cares about you and cares about your family. I remind people, if you'd have been the only one that had ever sinned, no matter who you are, no matter where you've been, Jesus would have died just for you. The message of the Bible is God is holy. And he created man and woman in his image to have a living relationship with him. But the Bible says, all we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned everyone to his own way. In other words, by our own lifestyle, we say, God, just butt out, leave me alone, want to run my own life. And God calls that sin. And because he's holy, he can't pretend you and I didn't do that. So God, who has always been Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, at a point in time over 2,000 years ago, God the Son became a helpless baby who lived without sin for 33 and a half years, 100% God, 100% man, not 50-50, 100% of both. I know that blows the refuse you have in your head. But God took him, nailed him to the cross, punished him in behalf of the whole human race, had to be an innocent sacrifice, had to, be, had to punish someone that was not worthy of death. And he bore all the sin from Adam to the last person that will ever live. So when you come to Jesus Christ, God is not able to, only able to forgive your sin. He will forget every sin you've ever committed. The blood of Jesus Christ, the Bible says, cleanses us from all sin. The Bible says the life of the flesh is in the blood. Without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sin. Jesus poured out his sinless life for our sinful lives. Then he makes life exciting. He said, I've taken my stand at the door and I'm knocking. And if anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and feast with that person. And that person will feast with me. You satisfy God's hunger for love. And you learn about God's love for you when you open the door of your heart to Jesus Christ. Well, we have a lot of questions left hanging over from last week. We have a lot of new ones. And you can send new ones in live while we're on the air using the by using the comments section on Facebook. And they will be inserted with the other questions that we have. <clears throat> And there's three that are very similar. Uh, so actually, I put them kind of all together here. And what it says, even if we assume that one particular religion is true, doesn't the existence of many religions at least prove that mankind likes to make up religious stories and that people have a tendency to believe them? How do you know yours isn't one of those? Now, the answer to the other two questions will help on that. It isn't that man, mankind likes to make up make up religions. The fact is, I'm convinced that God built in every human being the desire and the felt need to worship someone larger and bigger than yourself, someone that can meet your needs, someone that cares about you, someone that takes care of you. And I think that's something that God built into the human frame, into the human being. So God built that so we would come to know him and realize we needed to know God. Now, Oh, a similar question. How do you know the Bible is God's word? Why is it different than other books that claim to be divine? Well, I could give you a lot of reasons, but number one is the prophecies of the Bible. Before other religious leaders were born, nobody ever heard of them. But all the way from the book of Genesis, a coming Messiah was promised. Way back in the Garden of Eden, when Eve sinned, God, indi God indicated that Satan you know, who came as the serpent would bruise her seed's heel and he would crush his head. Now, he mentioned it would be the seed of the woman. 700 BC, just to give an illustration, Isaiah wrote, Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bring forth a son and call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. 100% God, 100% man. Isaiah said 700 years before his birth in chapter 9, Unto us a child is born and the son is given. God the Son, okay, came to be born as a child. Unto us a child is born, the Son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders. His name will be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government, peace, there will be no end. And I'm not going to quote the rest of it. Prophesying he would come. Isaiah, again, prophesied that he would be wounded for our transgressions, bruised for our iniquities. 
prophesied he'd make his grave with the wicked, plural, and with a rich man in his death. He was crucified between two thieves and laid in a rich man's tomb. Prophecies of Zechariah, uh, who indicated he'd, he'd be betrayed for 30 pieces of silver, and the silver would be used to buy the potter's field. And that was written 400 years before Judas Iscariot did that and threw the money into the temple and they bought the potter's field. Uh, Zach, I will read in the book of, uh, uh, in the book of, uh, of uh, uh, I'm sorry, we read in the book of Micah, 800 years before the birth of Jesus. But you, Bethlehem, on the way to Ephrathah, Though you be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of you shall he come forth unto me, whose goings have been from old, from everlasting, who shall rule my people Israel. And 800 years later, when the wise men came, saying, Where is he that is born king of the Jews? The scribes, the teachers of the law, went to the prophet, and, and they indicated the prophet Micah has said he must be born in Bethlehem, 800 B.C. And as, and as is pointed out, and I've used this many times on this program, the book Evidence That Demands a Verdict by Josh McDowell. He points out the chance of one man fulfilling eight prophecies that Jesus fulfilled, where he would be born, how he would die, things he would accomplish in his life, and so on, and what his family ancestry would be. Uh, he went on to indicate the chance of one man fulfilling eight prophecies that Jesus fulfilled was equal to covering the state of Texas two feet deep with silver dollars, have an X on one, blindfolding a man, and telling him to walk through and pick up a dollar. The chance of the man finding that is equal to Jesus fulfilling eight prophecies that he had no control over. Jesus fulfilled 333 prophecies of the Old Testament. That's just one way. Only the Bible predicted that Israel in the last days again would be a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense to all the nations of the world. Even the Bible commentaries, and I think I mentioned this last week, written in the 1800s, said these have to be taken spiritually for the church because Israel can never become a nation again. Well, those of those that believe the Bible meant what it said, said, no, no, Israel will be back in the land, and Jerusalem will be the headquarters of Israel once again, because all Bible prophecy is centered around the Jewish people and Jerusalem. And that's why Zechariah said in Zechariah 12, 13, and 14, 400 years before his birth, in that day Jerusalem will be a stone of the trembling and a rock of offense to all the nations of the world. And Zechariah 12, 13, and 14 describes the days that we're living in now. Now that's why we know the Bible is different than other books, okay? And then it says, does archaeological evidence prove the Bible? How do archaeological discoveries relate to the events in Scripture? I had a privilege of having three hours at master's level on, on biblical archaeology under Dr. Robert Cooley, uh, who had practiced as an archaeologist in addition to being a college professor. And Joseph Free was the textbook we used. Uh, he was professor of archaeology at Wheaton University. And even Albright, who is the godfather of biblical archaeology, said not one thing disproves the Bible, but rather everything found soundly backs up what the scripture said. For instance, such things as Sarah giving her Hagar, uh, her handmaid Hagar to Abraham to have a son, but the son was considered Sarah's son, not Hagar's. That was culturally true about 2000 BC, and the archaeologists have shown that. So many archaeology discoveries, so many things back up exactly what the scripture said. And again, to quote Albright, everything found supports the scripture. And so, so I love the feeling of, of archaeology. It was a great course. <laughs> and so why do we assume that Christianity is the true religion? Because of the prophecies and the fact that Jesus fulfilled them. And the things the Bible talks about coming to pass in the latter days are taking place on the front page of your up front page of your newspaper because nobody reads it anymore. Put on the actually taking place in the social media and TV, taking place all around us, and we can see that these things are happening. And so, yeah, they do make up religions, but the, but you have to have a you have to have a base for it. And again, put, God put in man's heart a need to worship. And that's why religions pop up all over. I say the devil loves religion. He loves it because religions like the flu shot can stop you from getting the real thing. I was religious till I was 19. 
recited the Apostles' Creed every Sunday. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate. I recited the Lord's Prayer every Sunday in church, our Father, which art in heaven, and so on, sang the doxology, praise God, from whom all blessings flow, but I didn't know Jesus. When I was 19 years old, I had a relationship. I met Jesus Christ, and he revolutionized my life. And that's what I love about preaching this gospel. I've had the privilege of preaching it over 60 years, traveled all over the world preaching it, as well as being in Kansas City here for 47 years, seeing lives transformed by the power of God in the mighty name of Jesus Christ, seeing people set free from every imaginable background that you can imagine, and seeing God heal and restore and deliver. The Bible works, folks. Christianity works because of changed and transformed lives down through all history and all over the world. Okay, here's another question. Can one person have all nine gifts of the Holy Spirit? Well, what you have within you is the giver of the gift and the energizer of the gift. Now, the usual word for gift in the Greek New Testament is the word doron. Wherever the word talking about the gifts of the Spirit is charisma that comes from charis, which is grace. Now, what I've tried to explain to people it, it, to know if God uses you in a manifestation, let's say the gift of healing, you do not own that gift. If I gave you my Bible, you wouldn't have to have my permission to use it. It would be yours to use fit as you wanted to. If I owned the gift of healing, I could walk through the hospital and heal everybody. But it doesn't work that way. And a lot of people make the mistake because God has given them a prophecy to think they have the gift of prophecy and they can use it whenever they want. And sometimes they make shipwreck of people's lives because they prophesy over them things that are not true. And the way I explain the gifts, the manifestations of the Spirit is described in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. The Holy Spirit is the power supply. All we are is the conduit. The Holy Spirit has to put the switch and decide when that gift is going to be in operation. We do not decide that ourselves. We don't own the gift. Again, we are the conduit through whom the Holy Spirit operates the gift. And when you say, can one person have all nine gifts, every Spirit-filled believer is available to be used by the Holy Spirit through all nine gifts as they're needed in the particular individual in uh, in the particular situation you find yourself. You know, when Peter and John went up to the gate of the temple, beautiful, and the lame man was there, Peter didn't say, I have to go call Brother Andrew because he has a gift of healing. And when the when Ananias and Sapphira lied to the Holy Spirit, he didn't say, I have to go get Brother John because he has a gift of discerning of spirits. The Holy Spirit will give you the gift that you need in a particular situation that you happen to be involved in. I've been in business meetings where someone would give a word of wisdom that they did it, and you could tell that was fresh from the Holy Spirit or a word of knowledge and uh and to know if a person is demon-possessed takes the, the gift of discerning of spirits. It's not the gift of discernment. Read it. It's the gift of discerning of spirits. In other words, the Holy Spirit will have to show you what spirit is operating through a person. And it's not something you can do naturally on your own. It's one of the manifestations of the spirit. I had a very unusual experience many years ago. And... Uh, they came up to me from the back of the church and they said, Pastor, there's a demon-possessed man back here. And when I got back there and prayed with him, he, he, he wasn't demon-possessed. I told him, this man's not demon-possessed. I got back to the platform again. A few minutes later, they came back and said, yes, he is. Come back out here again. I went back out there again and he wasn't demon-possessed. And I couldn't figure that out because when you're praying for someone, uh, you can tell. And, and I went back to the platform because God has used me that way. And they came back and said, he is. And I said, Father, I don't understand. The Holy Spirit spoke to me and said, the demon leaves before you get back there. So I had to go back and pray that God would, not only that he would set the man free so the demons could never come back again. The man was set free. But you have to be open to the Holy Spirit. He will give you the gift you need as you need it for the situation in which you find yourself. Did Jesus' original apostles reject Paul's role as an apostle. Well, when he first came in, they didn't. Don't forget, he was a persecutor of the church, and uh, he destroyed the church. Uh, uh, he, he, he threw the Christians in prison, 
And uh, when he first went back to Jerusalem, uh, most of the people were afraid to receive him. And as you read the book of Acts, he makes it clear that uh, the Barnabas brought him in among the apostles. And Paul discusses this in the book of Galatians. Okay, in the book of Galatians, uh, he meant that after 13 years, he came to Jerusalem. Let me, let me get back to Galatians here. Uh, the book of Galatians. I'm getting here. Uh, we read in... Uh, we read in chapter one, uh, it says, he says, after three years, when he first got saved, he went to Arabia and then he came back to Jerusalem after three years and abode with Peter 15 days. Other the apostles saw and none save James, the Lord's brother. And then he goes on. He was unknown and he was in Antioch. And then 14 years after I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas and Titus with me. And he went up to let them know primarily about what God was doing. But they were first scared of him. You know, I thought, this is a guy killing Christians. This is a guy throwing them in prison. And so it took Barnabas to bring him in. And then he went up and he talked to the other apostles, and he was widely accepted. And you can read about the Jerusalem Council in Acts chapter 15. And the big issue was the Judaizers who believe you, and once you're saved, you have to keep the Old Testament law. They didn't like it because you know, the church was rapidly becoming Gentile. And Paul was preaching that you don't have to keep that law anymore. It was abolished on the cross of Calvary. And they had the big Jerusalem council in Acts chapter 15. And uh, Paul makes it clear that he spoke to people privately. And when the council was over, Peter indicated, yeah, you know, James was actually the head of Jerusalem, the brother of Jesus. And he stood up and he said, now we, we can't put all of this on the Gentiles because Peter said not even ourselves could keep this Old Testament law. Not we nor our fathers could keep it. We certainly can't put it on the Gentiles. That's to abstain from idols and from blood and from fornication. That's all, none of the other things. And then, I know Peter, uh, Peter and James spoke to them and said, we'll go to the Jews and you all go to the Gentiles. So Paul and Barnabas became the apostles of the Gentiles, and Peter and James primarily to the Jews. So uh, it took a while for them to accept him because they were teaching you don't have to keep the Old Testament law. We still have some people that can't read that in the New Testament, and the New Testament is full of that truth. The whole book of Galatians presents five, seven arguments why the Christian is not under the Old Testament law. In Colossians, why the Christian is not under the Old Testament law. And after he says it, let no man judge you and meet or drink in respect of a holy day of the new moon or the Sabbath, which are only a shadow of things to come. But now the body is of Christ. Jesus said, I came not to destroy the law, but to fulfill it. When he fulfilled it, it was finished. In the same way it says that it might be fulfilled that the virgin might conceive and bring forth the son. When it was fulfilled, it was finished. It was done. It was over. And you can read in the book of Hebrews, the author takes 10 chapters to show the Jewish Christians they are not under that Old Testament law. Over and over, it is repeated in that 10 chapters. And it finally indicates God took away the first, that he may establish the second, that they have it has become void. It is no longer valid because Jesus fulfilled it. And there's always some people trying to put Christians back under that law. You got to keep the Jewish feast days. You got to do this. That's what Paul rebuked the Galatians for. Read the book of Galatians and read the book of Hebrews too at a single sitting sometime. And so there's always that controversy. And that was the big issue with the Jerusalem Council in Acts chapter 15. Okay, I've answered that one. Joshua 9 records the deception of the Israelites by the Gibeonites. After Israel discovered they'd been deceived, why did they still honor their contract? Well, the Gibeonites told them they were from a far country rather than the fact that they were dwelling in the land. And, and of course, then Joshua probably, uh, 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 he knew that they were to possess the land, so he made them a promise that he wouldn't kill them and he wouldn't destroy them. Well, then they found out the Gibeonites had lied. But they kept their side of the bargain, if you read it, because they had made the pledge in the name of the Lord. And Joshua was convinced anything he did in the name of the Lord, he had to honor that. Now, they did make them servants, hewers of wood and various other things. But they honored that thing that they had made. You make a promise in God's name, you better keep it. 
And Joshua was the kind of a man that kept it, even though the other people didn't. You can't be responsible for what other people do. You can only be responsible for what you do. The Bible doesn't make you responsible for anyone else's sin. They make you responsible for your own sin. Now, you need to be an example if you're a Christian because someone might see you do something and it might cause them to fall away. And so you have to be an example. What does God mean when he tells Isaiah to preach to people in a way that will prevent them from understanding and being forgiven? And this to be taken literally or ironically. Well, that would be Isaiah chapter 6. Uh, when Isaiah got his call finally, uh, he got his call to go ahead and proclaim. I have a paper clip on some pages here that I'm going to use for tomorrow night in our Bible study. So I have to take those off. Isaiah chapter 6. And you know, this is the year This is the year Isaiah had his vision. The year that King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord sitting upon the throne high and lifted up. Okay, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above it stood the seraphim. Each one had six wings with three he goes on to say, with two he covered his face, with two he covered his feet, and with two he did fly, and one cried unto another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts, the whole earth is full of his glory. And the post of the door moved with the voice of him that cried, and the house was filled with smoke. And I said, Woe is me, I'm undone. I'm a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the Lord of hosts, in other words, I'm a dead man. But, but, but he admitted he was a sinner. He admitted he had unclean lips. Okay? Woe was me. But then flew one of the seraphim with a live coal, which he had taken with a tongue from off the altar. He laid it upon my lips and said, Lo, this has touched your lips, and your iniquity is taken away, and your sin purged. You notice Isaiah said, I'm a man of unclean lips, and God touched him right where he needed to be touched. You read this book. God touches everyone where they need to be touched, not where someone else needs to be touched. He knows where you need to be touched tonight. And he's a God that will touch you where you need to be touched. Wherever you need to be forgiven, whatever strength you need, wherever you need power for, God will give you that because he will minister to your need at the time that you need it, no matter who you are, no matter where you've done. He ministers by the power of his Holy Spirit. You know, I think every person in the world knows that the, and I found this when I travel around the world, every person in the world knows that the Greek word for power is dunamis and dynamite comes from that. But I like the word dynamic. Because the Holy Spirit is the dynamic power of God. Uh, the engine in my car is dynamic. If I need to sit and idle, it'll let me sit and idle. If I need to speed away from a light, which I've been known to do, it'll let me speed away from a light. If I need to back up, it will help me back up. Okay, in the summer, I need <laughs> cold. In the winter, I need heat. That engine gives me what I need when I need it. Now, now, when I start to turn, it gives me more power to turn with power steering. When I stop to brake, it gives me power brake. It enables me to stop. I have to make the decision, but that dynamic engine makes it possible. You make a decision to serve, to serve God, to do the things that you can't do without him, and to stop doing the things you know you need to stop. You make the effort to do it, and he will give you his dynamic power to put it into practice. He doesn't make robots out of us. He never takes away our free will, but that's the dynamic power of the Holy Spirit. I had to, had, had to sidetrack on that. Sorry. And then he goes on to say, I heard the voice of the Lord saying, who shall we send and who will go for us? I said, here am I, send me. And this is the message the question was about. Go and tell this people, hear indeed, but understand not, and see indeed, but perceive not. Make the heart of this people fat, and make their ears heavy, and shut their eyes, lest they see with their eyes, hear with their ears, and understand with their heart, and be convert and heal. Then said I, Lord, how long? And he goes on to talk about the... He actually gives us the reason for, for it here, so I'm going to read it again. Then said I, Lord, how long? And he answered... Until the cities be wasted without inhabitant, and the houses without man, and the land be utterly desolate. And the Lord have removed men far away, and there will be a great forsaking in the midst of the Lamb. But yet it shall be for a tenth, and it shall return, and shall be eaten as a teal tree. Okay, now what's he saying? Because of the idolatry and immorality, they will not hear. Their hearts are stubborn. Their hearts are set on false gods. This is a prophecy of the truth that, were, that it would be. And they are not going to repent. Now, God sent them away captive for, captive for 70 years. 
And when they came back, then they no longer had idols in the land. So God meant exactly what he said. This is the way it's going to be, and it's going to happen. Here are some that have called me, sent in. Do you think angels still manifest themselves in human form? Well, the, I have heard of situations, uh, and it's uh, a number of years ago, one of the missionaries who was going through a dark part of Africa that no missionary had ever been. And it was a very dangerous part, headhunters and various people like that in the neighborhood. And they were going through. Well, there was a church in this country that the pastor felt impressed to ask the men of the church that would stand up and be counted to pray every day for this particular missionary and to intercede for him. And 24 men stood up in that service, okay? And they agreed to pray every day. And when this man got to his destination, it was he and his guide. And they, they were constantly looking around to see if anyone would bother them. No one bothered them. And when they got there, uh, someone came running and said, where are the others? What do you mean, where are the others? He said, well, where are the 24 warriors that were with you all the way through the jungle? And I've heard of other situations like that where the angels have appeared as men, which they were in the Old Testament. And a number of years ago, a missionary I heard from Tibet when I was in Bible college. Now, I was in Bible college in the 50s, okay? And so it was a long, long time ago. And um, when I was in Bible, in Bible college, they, mis they mentioned that the robber baron announced he was going to come into the village and kill the missionaries. And, of course, the police would join them so they wouldn't get killed when they come in. So they, they had a prayer meeting. They had a closet, a little prayer closet in their house, and they were praying all night, and they heard horses riding around their compound, and they actually heard some gunfire and some shouting, and nothing happened. And the next day they were at their breakfast table, and a knock came at the door, and the missionary went to the door, and outside were the robber baron and his man all on horseback, the robber baron standing at the door. And the missionary thought, oh, oh he's here to kill me. And he said, sir, I came to kill you last night, but we have a question. Who are those shining ones standing on your walls with swords all the way around? And uh, <laughs> eventually the whole bunch of them got saved. And so you know, the, uh, the Bible says in the book of Hebrews, he makes his angels spirits, meaning they're adjustable. Uh, whatever he needs them to be, whatever appearance he needs them to be, that's what they can become. What's the difference between Rhema and Logos? I think it is often overdone. Uh, many people believe Logos is just a general word and Rhema is a specific word from God to you. Now, it may be that way, but there are places in Scripture where one gospel will use Logos and another gospel will use Rhema for the same term. And so they're not always, they're not always separate. Many times they're interchangeable. So it will be on the context. But the word logos is the basic Greek word for word, and rhema is used as uh, or frequently as a specific word to you, but it is also used sometimes generally just as a general word. And the logos is very significant. I uh, recall John starts out that way, and the beginning was the word. The Greek word is logos, the word. And the word was with the God, and God was the word, meaning the word was divine. The word was the same as God, except it was not the God. He was the word. Um, and the word logos was very significant in that day, especially because the Greek philosopher, uh, 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 he used the word logos to explain things about God he didn't understand. His name was Philo. And he tried to harmonize, he actually tried to harmonize Greek philosophy with the Old Testament scriptures. And uh, he indicated, how do you get through to, to God? Well, you have to meet the Logos. And, and he has in his writings the Logos meeting the needs of people and the Logos pouring out the blessing of God and the Logos doing this in behalf of God. But it was just a, a theological concept. Well, John is saying, I want you to know who the Logos is. The word became flesh and pitched his tent in our midst. And we saw his glory, the glories of the unique one of the Father, full of grace and truth. And so he used the philosopher's term to go way beyond what they did with it. And it was just a term with the philosophers. But again, logos is generally a common word, but rhema may be used interchangeably the same way. So you can't be specific. And 
Uh, even logos sometimes is a direct word from God, but rhema is more often a direct word from God for you. Uh, what are the Leviathan and the Behemoth? The Leviathan is generally the crocodile, and the Behemoth would be the hippopotamus. Okay, you can also read in the New Testament uh, about the unicorn. The unicorn is a rhinoceros. And so the Leviathan is the, as the crocodile or the alligator, and the behemoth is the hippopotamus. Okay, old, old, old words for the same animals that we're familiar with. What's the best way to approach dating after a divorce, especially if kids are involved? Now, I contacted some people about this that have been through this, and I wanted to get their opinion. I have my own, but I haven't been through anything like that. Now, I've done marriage counseling, and for many, many, many years, before we had full-time counselors at the church, the church was too small to have full-time counselors, so I was it. Even though I did have 12 hours of family counseling at doctoral level, along with all the other counseling courses I'd had it at master's level. But the best way to approach dating after a divorce, they didn't. And so I actually got some emails back, and I wrote down some comments from other people. I'll give you mine first. Number one, when you do, make sure that you've had time to heal. And the others all said the same thing. Don't be on the rebound. Don't be on the rebound. Give yourself time to heal. It takes time. Don't be in a rush. And uh, be careful if you've been in a an abusive relationship. Because sometimes you might think that is normal and you fall into another abusive relationship. An abusive relationship is not normal. It is abnormal. There is never, never, never an excuse for an abusive relationship. And so only Christians, only Christians, don't date non-Christians. Don't be so feeling so alone that you date non-Christians because non-Christians want to date you. Don't fall for that trap, okay? Nine times out of 10, they will lead you away from God instead of you leading them to God, maybe even more than nine times out of 10. And then when there's children involved, don't have a bunch of men and men or women, whatever the case is, coming in and out, okay? It's not healthy for the children. You can't bring a bunch of ladies home if you're a man. You can't bring a bunch of men home if you're a lady. So never introduce your kids to dates until it becomes serious. And that's the person you want to spend the rest of your life with. Then introduce them to your children, okay? And then try to introduce them even then gradually. And so never, uh, never go out on a date without other people being around. So it's not a physical relationship because that won't work. That won't work. Okay. That won't work. So, so give yourself plenty of time, pray, ask God to give you direction, have God not to help you fall into a trap because being alone can be very difficult and you can get anxious and you can get in a hurry and you can't be in a hurry with God. God will bring about the right person. And I've seen so many people over the years that have been through the tragedy of divorce, and it's always tragedy. And uh, there's always hurt. There's always children that are crushed. Uh, when there's children involved, it's one of the most difficult situations in life for children. I went through it. My dad, and I was a teenager. I wasn't a small child. My dad came home, and uh, he and I were always like best buddies. We'd golf together. We'd go out together. And he came home one day and said, I've got somebody else. I'm leaving goodbye. I walked out of our lives when I was a teenager. Left us with the corporation executive. Left us, left us with no car in Detroit. I left us without any money. We had a house that wasn't paid for. And my mother had a job. And I started working when I was 16. And uh, I made up my mind someday I was going to kill him because I saw my mother cry for two years. But in the meantime, my mother accepted the Lord, and she got me to go to that crazy church she was going to when I was 19, and I accepted the Lord, and then went to witness to my dad, and then I wanted my wife and my children to know their grandfather, and I got to lead my dad to accept Jesus Christ when he was 89 years old. And uh, so, you know, the Lord helps you put away the hurts of the past, but 
divorce always hurts. It's always, always, always hard. And so, so just take your time. Just take your time and let God heal and let God restore and let God make you whole before you go out start start looking for a relationship. And again, keep it Christian. Keep it Christian in the dating. Keep it Christian in who you meet. And again, the two of them said almost exactly the same thing. Don't be in a hurry. And don't keep bringing different people into the home for your children. Okay? In Mark chapter 13, okay, there's some other ones I've got all, are all, are all stuck together here. So let me pull them apart and see what they are. In Mark chapter 13, where do you place Mark's first recipients in the timeline of apocalyptic events? Where do you locate us now almost 2,000 years later? And this one says, was the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD described in Jesus' prophecies of Matthew 24, or was he describing something else? In Mark, and then when the trumpet sounds, will everyone hear it or only the Christians? So let me get my Bible here, and we'll look at Mark chapter 13 first. Mark chapter 13. Now, Mark is the shorter version of Matthew 24 and 25, okay? Mark chapter 13. Mark's gospel is much shorter than the other gospels. Mark is not concerned about a lot of teaching. He's writing to the Romans or concerned in action, and so he keeps referring, Jesus immediately did this and immediately did that and immediately did this. But in Mark chapter 13, he starts out. At, in Matthew 24 and Mark 13 start out with the same questions. that he said upon the temple, one of the disciples said unto him, Master, see what manner of stones and what buildings are here. Jesus answered, you see all these buildings? There shall not be one stone left upon another that shall not be thrown down. Now that was talking about the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD. And as he said upon the Mount of Olives over against the temple, Peter and James and John and Andrew came privately. Tell us when shall these things be? And what shall be the sign of all these things being fulfilled? And Matthew adds, what will be the sign of your coming? In Matthew 24, he uses the Greek word parousia and of the end of the age. So he asked, when will Jerusalem be destroyed? What will be the sign of your parousia, your coming, and the end of the age? Tell us when shall these things be, and what shall be the sign when these things shall be fulfilled? Take heed lest men deceive you, for many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and deceive many. When you shall hear of wars and rumors of wars, be not troubled, for such things must be, but the end is not yet. And nation shall rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. There shall be earthquakes in various places. There shall be famines and troubles. These are the beginning of birth pains. Now, Matthew stretches out a little longer and says the same thing. These are general things going on that will increase as you get toward the end time. Now, when you, and he goes on to say, take heed to yourselves. They will deliver you up to councils. You're brought before rulers. Kings for my name, so it's a testimony against them. That's happened to Christians all down through the ages. This gospel must be preached among all nations, and Matthew adds, then shall the end come, and the end is the battle of Armageddon in Revelation 19, not the rapture. The end is the battle of Armageddon when Jesus comes back as King of kings and Lord of lords. Okay, And he talks about delivering and God giving you what to say. Brother will rise up against brother, hated among all nations for my name's sake. Now, all the way down through verse 13 is the whole history we're living in now. Then he says, when you see the abomination of desolation, that will take place according to the book of Revelation and Daniel, when the coming world ruler called the Antichrist, the mystery of iniquity, the lawless one, the prince that shall come, the king of fierce countenance, okay, the one who honors the God of forces and fortresses, when he comes on the scene and puts his image in the Holy of Holies in the temple of Jerusalem, that begins the middle of the great of the seven year great tribulation period, according to the book of Revelation. And so we are right now up to in that area just prior to verse 13. Okay, that's the question on Mark 13. We are there. 
was the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD described in Jesus' prophecies in Matthew 24? No, it is not. Now, they asked Jesus about it, but Matthew 24 does not discuss the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD. You have to go to Luke 21 to get the good description of that. So let me turn to Luke chapter 21. Luke chapter 21. Turn over here. Luke chapter 21. He says, when you see Jerusalem surrounded with armies, know that the desolation thereof is near. That let them which are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let them which are in the midst of it depart out. Let them that are in the countryside not enter into it. For these be the days of vengeance, and all things which are written may be fulfilled. Woe unto them that with child, to them that give suck in those days. Why? Because if you got a baby to take care of, it's going to be tough. There should be great distress in the land and great wrath upon this people. They shall fall by the edge of the sword and shall be led away captive unto all nations. And Jerusalem shall be trodden down to the Gentiles until the time of the Gentiles be fulfilled. And in the, in the book of Revelation, chapter 11, it mentions at that point there are three and a half years left in the time of the Gentiles. In the book of Revelation, chapter 11. So the time of the Gentiles has run all the way from 70 AD, and it will go on until Revelation chapter 11, okay? Now, Matthew only describes, describes the other things. And then the second part of the question, was Jesus describing something else? Yes. In Matthew 24, and this causes a lot of confusion on people's parts, Matthew chapter 24. Turn over. And again, the three questions are asked. When will Jerusalem be destroyed? What will be the sign of your parousia? That's the word that's translated coming. That refers to the event we call the rapture. And the end of the age refers to the battle of Armageddon in Revelation chapter 19, when Jesus comes back as king of kings and lord of lords. Now, he gives the history such as many false prices, Christ coming, famine, distress in various places, the beginning of birth pains, okay? Then he says, this gospel of the kingdom, he that endures to the end shall be saved. Now, we have to understand Matthew's arrangement of the gospel. Matthew is not as concerned about chronology as he is about topic. And anyone that has carefully studied Matthew's gospel know that he arranges some things topically. For instance, the temptation of Jesus. Matthew and Luke both put the first temptation turned stones into bread. Luke puts the second one, showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time, said everything you have if you'll bow down and worship me. Matthew shows the second one, throw yourself down from the pinnacle of the temple. For it's written, they will give his angels charge over you, lest you dash your foot against the stone. They shall bear you up. Luke puts a, th Luke puts a third temptation, cast yourself down from the pinnacle of the temple. Matthew puts it, he showed them all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. He says, all this I'll give to you if you bow down and worship me. Why? Because Matthew's gospel is topical. And he's trying to present Jesus Christ as king of the Jews. His gospel is primarily the Jew. And he's trying to show what will happen in relationship to the Jewish people with their promised Messiah, Jesus. And the one born to be king, that's the greatest temptation. So that's the climax, showing his topical arrangement rather than chronological. Well, Matthew 24 is the same way. He puts down, and after he describes the general time, he puts down the last three and a half years of the tribulation first. Why? Because it's the middle of the tribulation, according to Revelation 13 and Daniel 13, that Israel will have the spiritual blinders taken off their eyes. Again, to put it bluntly, when the, when the Antichrist puts his image in the Holy of Holies in Jerusalem, the one lesson the Israelites have learned in 4,000 years of history is God hates idols. That's when God's going to remove the spiritual blinders from their eyes, that they will finally recognize Jesus Christ as their Messiah. And according to Daniel 12 and Revelation 12, Michael and his angels will come on the scene to fight for them as the Antichrist and Satan try to destroy them, and they will be preserved for the last three and a half years of the tribulation period. 
And so he describes the last three and a half years. Now he says, this gospel shall be preached in all the witness for a world, then shall the end come, not the rapture. The end of the age has to come. And if you read in Revelation chapter 14, prior to the battle of Armageddon, an angel flies through heaven, preaching the everlasting gospel to the whole earth. Then that's before the end of the battle of Armageddon in Revelation 19. And then now he's talking now about the last three and a half years because it has to do with Israel. When you therefore see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place, again, the holy of holies in Jerusalem, whosoever reads, let him understand. Let them which be in Judea flee into the mountains. Uses some of the same terminology as Luke uses, but it's a different event. Let him which is in the housetop not come down to take anything out of his house. Neither let him that's in the field return to take his clothes. Woe unto them with child, and them to give suck in those days. Pray that your flight be not in the winter, neither on the Sabbath day. Why? It's obviously referring to Israel because only the Jews can go only so far on a Sabbath day, according to their law. Then shall be great tribulation such as was not since the beginning of the world of this time, no one ever shall be. And except those days should be short, there will be no flesh saved, but for the elect's sake, now in the book of, in this chapter of Matthew, those will be the Jews that receive Jesus Christ, according to Revelation and Daniel, the same passages. And many shall come unto you, say, here is Christ, or there is Christ, believe not. Through a lies false Christ and false prophets shall deceive in great signs and as much if it were possible they deceive the very elect. I've told you these things. Wherefore, if they say unto you, he's here in the desert, don't go out. Behold, he's in the secret place, believe it not. For as a lightning comes out of the east, this is the brightness of the parousia. When Jesus Christ comes back as King of kings and Lord of lords at the end of the great tribulation, shines even unto the west, so shall the coming of the Son of Man be. Wherever the carcass is, there will the vultures be gathered together, whatever you're feeding on. If you're feeding on the false prophets, you'll be gathered to them, but you'll be feeding on the Lord. Immediately after the tribulation of those days, shall the sun be darkened, the moon shall not give her light, the stars shall fall from heaven, the powers of the heaven shall be shaken. That takes place at the middle of the tribulation, under the opening of the sixth seal in Revelation 6. So Jesus himself calls the first three and a half years, described in that chapter has also part of the tribulation. Then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. And then shall all tribes of the earth mourn when they see the man, Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with great glory. He shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet. They shall gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. And so Matthew, first of all, describes the book of Revelation. Then he goes on and describes the rapture of the church, okay? As it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the days of the coming of the Son of Man. Okay, this is the rapture of the church now he describes, the parousia, eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, business as usual. Okay, even the first half of the tribulation is business as usual. It won't be business as usual with 20... <laughs> Uh, in the first half of the tribulation with 25% of the earth's population killed. A third of those that are left are killed in the second half. You can read the book of Revelation. For on the days that were before the flood, they were eating, drinking, marrying, and giving in marriage till the day that Noah entered the ark knew not till the flood came and the Son of Man took them all away. So shall the coming, parousia. That's where we use for rapture, the Son of Man be. Then at that time, two shall be in the field, one taken, the other left. Two grinding at the mill, one taking the other left. And someone asked me in a college class years ago, they say, now, wait a minute. It says the flood came and took them all away. And you're saying the next verse where it says, you know, two grinding in the field, one taking the other left. How can that mean anything but the fact that they're taken away and killed because they're Christians? Because if the word taken in one verse means to be taken and killed in the flood, and the word taken in the next verse can't mean caught up to heaven. Well, unfortunately, translators are, are hardly ever students of prophecy. And there's two different Greek words used for taken. Of course, it says, where it says the flood came and took them all away. It's a Greek verb, I roll. That's used in John 15. Every branch of me that's not bearing fruit, my father takes away. I roll. But the word taken, where it says two in the field, one taken, the other left. Two grinding at the mill, one taken, the other left. It's a Greek word, paralambano, that means to be received alongside of. 
And that's what Jesus used in John 14. If I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and paro lambani to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. Translators are not usually students of prophecy. They're more concerned about grammar and syntax and all that kind of thing. Uh, and, and that's true of the phrase in Matthew 24 and also in Mark 13. Uh, however, it says this generation shall not pass away till all these things be fulfilled. The word translate generation, the number one meaning of it is descendants of a certain ancestor. Okay, it's not, it's ganas, descendants of a certain ancestor. So all Jesus is saying, the Jewish race will not pass away till all things be fulfilled. He's not saying it has to happen within 40 years. So prophecy does get kind of sticky. Will everyone hear uh, when the trumpet sounds, will everyone hear it? I don't know. We don't have any way to know. We know the Christians will hear it. Uh, we don't. Uh, we don't know. Now, we don't know exactly when. Uh, we don't know who's going to hear it. We're not told. So anything, I, anything we say is pure speculation. Our regeneration, example being born again of the Spirit, and John received, receiving, being given the Spirit, and there's a whole bunch of verses quoted, the same thing. I believe that all who believe in Christ as their Lord and Savior are given the Holy Spirit, who fills and indwells all Christians and sanctifies those who have been justified. But obviously the spirit is also the one who regenerates sinners. So my question is, are regeneration, spiritual birth, and infilling of the spirit, beginning of sanctification, the same thing? Yes, those are the, big, uh, are the same thing, but not the baptism in the Holy Spirit. Everyone, when you receive Jesus Christ, he says, I will come in unto you. I've taken my stand at the door and I'm knocking. If any hear, man hear my voice and open the door, I will come in unto him and he with me. How does he come in? By the Holy Spirit. Uh, he, he said in John 14, I'm going to send you another comforter, the Holy Spirit. He said, by the way, when he comes, the Father and I are coming with him. That's why he's called the Spirit of God, the Spirit of God's Son, the Spirit of Christ, the Spirit of him that raised Christ from the dead, the Holy Spirit, okay, and so on. And so the Holy Spirit comes in. You are born again by the Spirit. And uh, Jesus told Nicodemus, except a man be born again. And Jesus, Nicodemus said, how can a man enter his mother's womb and be born? And Jesus said, no, you have to be born of water and the Spirit. Now, he's not talking about baptism. There's nothing in that context talks about baptism. Some people, every time they see water, want to add baptism. But the ancients knew that, as well as we do, a baby's born from a bag of waters. So Nicodemus said, can I enter into my mother's womb and be born again? Jesus said, no. You have to be born of water, which is the natural birth, your mother's birth. You have to be born of water and the spirit. And the next verse is explained. It's called parallelism. You have to be born of water and the spirit. He explains it. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. That which is born of the spirit is spirit. In other words, you get into your mother's womb a hundred times, but you're still flesh. You have to be born of the spirit. So you're born of the spirit. The Holy Spirit bears witness with your spirit. You're a child of God. In God's sight, you are sanctified. You begin growing as a Christian, manifesting the fruit of the spirit. But Jesus breathed on the apostles in John 20 and received you the Holy Spirit. When Jesus said something had happened, but he also told the same group of people in Acts chapter 1. Now, John truly baptized in the water, but you shall receive power after that the Holy Spirit has come upon you. But he used the word baptize. John truly baptized in the water, but you shall be baptized into the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So when you are saved, you receive the Holy Spirit. But there is a baptism of power. It is a baptism of ministry, a baptism of power to enable you to witness. It's an intensification. It's the difference between pouring water in a cup and saying the cup has water or immersing the cup down under, and when you bring it up, it's full and running over. So Jesus called it being baptized in the Holy Spirit, but when Luke describes it, he says they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, and as a result of that, they began to speak heteros glossolalia, different languages from what they knew, okay, as the Holy Spirit gave the inspiration, as the Holy Spirit gave the articulation or the utterance. And so there is a baptism of the Holy Spirit for power, and Paul the Apostle received that.
Now, we don't read what happened when Paul received the Holy Spirit, but years later, as Paul the Apostle, he said, I thank God I speak in tongues more often than all, because the Holy Spirit prays through you, and that's a gift that God intends for every believer to have. So you receive the Holy Spirit at salvation, but being immersed in the Spirit. In Luke's gospel, Jesus said God would give the Holy Spirit to those that keep on asking him. Now, the only ones that are going to be asking him are those that already have the Holy Spirit. And there's a hint in John's gospel where it says God doesn't give the Holy Spirit to Jesus by measure. Okay? So there's always more. You can always be more. The way I describe it, when you receive the Holy Spirit, you have the Holy Spirit. When you're baptized in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit has you. And he takes control of your lips and tongues, and you speak a language you don't know. I make no apologies for saying I pray in the Spirit. And the book of Jude in verse 20 says, You, beloved, building up yourselves in your most holy faith, the Greek verb is oikodemeo, building a house on a solid foundation, building up yourselves in your most holy faith, how praying in the Holy Spirit. Paul makes it clear in 1 Corinthians 14, a literal translation, I want you all to keep on speaking in tongues, for he that speaks in an unknown tongue edifies himself. Oikodemeo, build you up in the Lord. It's the Holy Spirit interceding through you according to your need. And the Bible says in Romans 8, when you don't know what to pray for, not when you don't know how to pray, when you don't know what to pray, the Holy Spirit makes intercession with sounds that you can't make speak, meaning you can't originate them. And Paul says, indicates when he prays in the Spirit, he doesn't know what he's saying. So I'll pray in the Spirit, I'll pray with the understanding, I'll sing with the Spirit, I'll sing with the understanding. And uh, he makes it very clear that though the Bible, there's nothing in the Bible teaches these manifestations that ever pass away. Now, because you're baptized in the Holy Spirit, praying in a language that's not yours doesn't mean you're any more spiritual than anyone else. That's not what it's all about. It gives you more power in your own life to be what God wants you to be and to do what God wants you to do. That power of the Holy Spirit. The same Holy Spirit, I call it an intensification. Okay, the difference between receiving and being immersed. But you receive the Holy Spirit at salvation. Paul says in Ephesians 1. And by the way, read Ephesians 1 from verse 3 through verse 14. It's all one long sentence in the original. All one long sentence describing eight spiritual blessings we have because we're in Jesus Christ. And God has chosen, elected, predestined those that are in Christ. He hasn't decided who those are. That's up to us. The Bible makes it clear twice in the New Testament, God's not willing that one soul should perish, okay? God wants everyone to be saved. But, but God has chosen and elected those that are in Christ. We have the choice whether we're in Christ or not. Again, the last message of the Bible, the spirit and the bride say, come, let him that hears say, come, let him that's thirsty come, and whosoever will. Whosoever will exercise his or her will, let them come and drink of the water of life freely. But he ends up by saying, after you believe, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession. And the Greek word arabon, arabona, translated earnest in Ephesians 1 is the, is the modern Greek word for engagement ring. And so you receive the engagement ring. The Holy Spirit is the engagement ring of heaven. And you know there's going to be a wedding one of these days, the marriage supper of the Lamb. Okay, had, okay I had to throw that in. <laughs> what scriptures speak, speak specifically to reading horoscopes? I recently read a Christian blog that it's a sin tend to believe in them but not to read them for fun. Your thoughts? Well, I, I, the Bible doesn't say anything, say anything about reading them for fun. It, about the only thing it says about horoscopes is the book of Isaiah, chapter 47. And I remind you that Babylon, Babylon in the Bible, is man's organized rebellion under Satan against God. Babel actually started in Genesis chapter 10 with a man by the name of Minrod, Nimrod. Said he was a mighty hunter before the Lord. And the, and the Hebrew idiom is in your face, God. The next thing you read about the Tower of Babel, God told men to organize. God told men to fill the earth. And they said, no, we're going to build us whose tower may reach to heaven. Let's God scatter us around the earth. And you read in the days of Peleg in Genesis 10, the earth was debated was divided. We read in Genesis 11, why the Tower of Babel, God scattered them all over the earth. 
and Genesis indicated that's when the earth was divided. Constance, um, you know, most scientists now, now admit the earth was probably once all joined together, all right, scattered the people over the face of the earth. And uh, uh, it was man's organized rebellion against God. You go to Isaiah 14, it talks about Babylon 200 years before the Neo-Babylonian Empire of Nebuchadnezzar. And he says, how are you fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, angel of the morning? For you said in your heart, I will ascend above the throne of God. I will sit in the congregation of the north. I will be like the most high that you shall be brought down to hell to the sides of the pit. Shows Lucifer behind Babylon. When you get to the book of Revelation, the final world system is called Babylon. In the book of Revelation, you have political Babylon, the worldwide religious system headed by the 10 nation confederacy under the Antichrist. You have the buying and selling the worldwide worldwide commercial system controlled by the false prophet. You have the worldwide religious system under the false prophet. And the announcement is made, Babylon has fallen, Babylon has fallen. In Revelation 17, religious Babylon falls. In Revelation 18, commercial Babylon falls. In Revelation 19, political Babylon falls when Jesus Christ comes back as King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And so Babylon is man's organized rebellion under Satan against God. Well, Babylon originated the horoscopes. Babylon originated the horoscopes, okay? The horoscope is nothing but a, but a, bunch, of, a bunch of nonsense. So here's what the Bible, here's about all the Bible says about the horoscopes, okay? Stand now with your enchantments. He's addressing Babylon, by the way. O, o virgin daughter of Babylon. Okay, he's addressing Babylon, all right? Stand now with your enchantments from the multitude of your sorceries wherein you've labored from your youth. If, shall, if so be, you shall be able to profit. If so be, you may prevail. You are wearied in the multitude of your counselors. Let now the astrologers and the stargazers and the monthly prognosticators stand up and save you from the things that shall come upon you. Behold, they shall be a stubble. The fire shall burn them. They shall not deliver themselves from the power of the flame. There shall not be a coal to warm at, nor a fire to sit before. Thus shall they be unto you whom you have labored, even your merchandise from your youth. They shall wander unto his quarry, and none shall save them. Now, that's the only mention of the astrologers. You do read about the astrologers in the days of Daniel, meant those that studied the scars. But you have no need of that doing a Christian. If you want to make fun of it, that's one thing. But don't ever, 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 ever take it seriously. They used to ask me, what are you? What do you mean, what are you? Why are you an Aquarius or a Hootenanny or what are you? I said, no, I'm a Christian. They said, well, what's your sign? I said, January 28th, 1951, I was born again under the sign of the cross. <laughs> and so that's my sign. Okay. All that kind of garbage is pure, pure, unadulterated nonsense. Okay. Yeah, yeah, I'd say a hooting at me. <laughs> now, this is an unusual question. I never had one like this before at all. And I did the live TV program for 24 years doing this. Apart from the Trinity, is the Holy Spirit a person or a spirit? A minister friend of mine said that the Holy Spirit is a person and should never be referred to as, is a spirit and should never be referred to as a person. I'm sure he was insinuating that the Holy Spirit has never been a person in body. Or if it had me searching the scriptures. I always thought the statement God in three persons was scriptural and took it literally. Where is it stated that the Holy Spirit is a person or the Spirit is not a person? Well, the, the, the Bible attributes the activities of personhood to the Holy Spirit. He teaches. He guides. He intercedes. He strengthens. Those are activities of a person. We're not talking about humanity. Uh, in John chapter 7, speaking of the womb of Samaria, Jesus says, God is a spirit. Does that mean the Father's not a person either? He said, God is a spirit. And they that worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. Some people get hung up on words. But a person is talking about things. The Holy Spirit does things a person does. God the Father does things a person does. That's what the phrase means, the Holy Spirit in three persons. The only one that became human was God the Son. God the Father never became human, and yet he is, he is also, I don't think anyone 
anyone, anyone would call the Father, not a person, but the, the attributes of personhood are attributed to the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit in Genesis 1, the Spirit of God fluttered on the face of the deep. That's an activity of a person, not a human person, a person. And so I think he's making a deal out of words that should not be made, okay? Should not be made. The attributes of person, personhood certainly belong to the Spirit. Didn't Mary have other children after Jesus? Yes. Uh, the Bible indicates that Joseph did not have sexual relations with Mary until after she had brought forth her firstborn son. Uh, let me turn over to Matthew chapter 14 here and read for you. And you can find the same thing in Mark's gospel. And it came to pass as Jesus finished these parables, he departed from there. And we can come into his own country. He taught them in the synagogues inasmuch as they were astonished and said, where does this man have wisdom and these mighty works? Is not this the carpenter's son? Is not his mother called Mary? This is Matthew 14, 50, I'm sorry, 13, 55. And his brothers, James and Joseph and Simon and Judas and his sisters, are they not with us? So he had brothers and he had sisters. And I remind you in the book of Galatians, Paul says he saw none of the apostles other than Peter. He saw James, the Lord's brother. Okay, James, the Lord's brother. James, the Lord's brother. And let me try to... Uh, 1 Corinthians... Paul makes a statement defending his apostleship, which some people were trying to undermine, okay? Trying to undermine and take away his authority, uh, his authority as an apostle. And Trying to see. Paul makes a statement in uh, in First Corinthians. I can usually find things right away, but, but I can't seem to find this one. He makes the statement: "Do not I, I, I have the ability to lead about a sister, a spouse, as well as the apostles and the brothers of our Lord, of our Lord." And if you read when Jesus was invited to the feast in Cana of Galilee, okay, the feast in Cana of Galilee, it says he was there with his mother and his brothers and his apostles, okay? His mother and his brothers and his apostles. So Jesus definitely, uh, he definitely had other people. What race of people did Noah curse? That is one of the most misused scriptures in the whole Bible. I get so aggravated at the way people twist scripture sometimes. But Noah was in the ark. And the first thing he did when he came out of the ark, a lot of people will tell you he got drunk. Okay. And uh, his descendants have been at it ever since. He planted a vineyard and got drunk. And... And it indicates that Noah was, uh, let me start, start in verse 20 of that, verse 20 of, uh, I'm sorry, of Genesis chapter 9. And Noah began to be a farmer and planted a vineyard. He drank of the wine and was drunk and he was uncovered in his tent. And Ham, the father of Canaan, saw the nakedness of his father and told his two brothers without. And Shem and Japheth took a garment and laid it upon both their shoulders and went backward and covered the nakedness of their father. Their faces were backward and they didn't see their father's nakedness. Noah awoke from his wine and knew it's his youngest son. Now, unfortunately, the King James says youngest son, and I'll comment about that in a minute, had done unto him. And he said, Cursed be Canaan, a servant of servants shall he be unto his brothers. And he blessed the Lord God of Shep, and Canaan shall be his servant, and God shall enlarge Japheth, and he will dwell in the tents of Shem, and Canaan shall be his servant. Now, 
uh, number one, what he said, first of all, he knew what his youngest had done. Ancient Hebrew had no word for grandfather and grandson. Okay, Jesus is called the son of David, even though he was a thousand years later. No word for grandson or grandfather. So when it said look, Noah's youngest, he meant his youngest grandson, who was Canaan. Now, apparently, you have to read between the lines, Karen, Canaan had done something to either uncover his grandfather or he had done something to him while he was uncovered. We're not told. But the one that was cursed was Canaan. Nobody else, just Canaan. And it said he will be a servant of servants. That was not against a particular race. When the Israelites, who had been slaves in Canaan, came in and conquered the land of Canaan, Canaanites became servants to servants, and that prophecy was fulfilled. That prophecy was totally fulfilled 1,000 B.C. It is not for any particular race apart from other races. Strictly, the curse was on Canaan, okay? When God created Abram, after years of silence and everything he had occurred in between, why do you think he reminded him he was El Shaddai, the Almighty God? Because he was making all kinds of promises to Abraham that had Abram that hadn't had it yet. Now he promised him a son when he was in his 80s, and now he's getting close to 99, and he still doesn't have a son. So he reminded that he was El Shaddai. He was able to do what he had promised because he's the all-powerful God. He's the almighty. There is nothing that you need that God can't do. Nothing that you need. And we go through difficulties and times in our Christian life when we question, when we wonder what's going on, when we can't understand what's happening to us. Uh, we just don't understand, but we trust God in the middle of the situations. I'm reminded at my age, I'm 88, that Billy Graham said nothing prepared him for old age, and I would say amen. Uh, I don't feel old, but my legs don't want to walk like they used to. Uh, and uh, But, uh, you know, a lot of things uh, the, 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 that, that we wear out. But we go through difficulties in life. There's times when it seems like God's not there. He tests our faith. If you never had to use faith, what good would it be? Uh, it's like a muscle. If you don't use it, it'll atrophy. I know if I've missed going to the health club for a while and I try to lift the same amount of weights that I was lifting before, I can't do it because I've, my, my muscles started to atrophy. So you have to keep it up. You have to keep practicing. You have to keep doing it. You have to keep doing things with your arms and legs or the muscles will atrophy. And so it's the same way spiritually. The, the, the muscle, faith muscle, will atrophy if it's never tested. Okay, never tested. Uh, what difficult questions is the church challenged by postmodernists? I mentioned something about postmodernism last week. Someone asked what it was, and I have a quote that the only absolute truth is the absolute truth that there is no absolute truth. Okay, that's postmodernism. The only absolute truth is the absolute truth that there is no absolute truth. And I say, well, if you think that's not true, don't believe in the law of gravity and jump off a roof and see what happens. There are absolute truths. The word of God is full of absolute truths. Postmodern likes to say, you've got a right to believe what you want. Uh, we believe what I want. I believe this. You believe that. That's okay with you. That's okay with me. And that's postmodernism. There's no absolute truth. That's the basic thing that it all comes down to. Okay, the basic thing it all comes down to. Okay, again, you can send your questions in by writing in the comment sections on YouTube. I've got a lot of questions here, but I like the live ones too. How does the book of Acts fit into the larger narrative of the Bible? The book of Acts shows the growth of Christianity from the, uh, uh, and actually from the ascension of Christ into the middle of the first century. That's as far as it goes, into the middle of the first century. And that's where it fits into the, uh, that's where it fits into the larger narrative of the Bible. And you, you need to read it to see what happens and, and how God spread the word. And it's written by Luke, the beloved physician. And so Luke and Acts are really two parts of one book. So you, you read, it's a good idea to read the Gospel of Luke and then read and then read the book of Acts together. And when you read the Bible, ignore the chapter divisions. 
because sometimes they interrupt it in the verses. Just read it like it is continuously. Don't forget, these were single manuscripts. The letters of Paul were letters. They were not divided up into chapters and verses. The chapters and verses were added in the Middle Ages for convenience. But uh, they oftentimes hinder or interrupt what God is trying to tell us. Uh, a lot of people pull Romans 7 out of Romans 6 and 8. You can't do that. You've got to, re you've got to read all three together. It, and so the book fits into the story how the gospel went from Jerusalem to Judea to Samaria to the uttermost parts of the earth as Paul carried it throughout the Roman Empire and other people did too. Oh, by the way, when New Testament times, when they say all the world, what they mean is the Roman Empire. Any part of the Roman Empire, when they said all the world, they meant the Roman Empire. In the Old Testament, when they said all the world, they meant all the world that that king rules over. Or you better use the phrase all the world or that king will have you killed. Okay? And that was in the Old Testament. Do you think God speaks through prophets today like in the Bible? I had an experience where a so-called prophet spoke over my life and it didn't set right. I didn't feel like it was from God. It probably wasn't from God. Because the Holy Spirit, the God will not send a prophet to run your life. He may give someone a prophetical word to confirm what God has told you. But there's a lot of phony prophets running around today, and I don't hesitate to say that. Saying, God, God told me that you're supposed to give me so much money. That's a false prophet. Okay, that is not a prophet according to the word of God. And there's a lot of that going on today, a lot of that going around and the, the, God does give a word of prophecy, a word of encouragement. I was actually in the army. Uh, I've told you before, before on the program, uh, I wasn't saved till I was 19. I got and I got called to preach, baptized in the Holy Spirit. But then I got drafted in the army when I was 20. And I was in basic training, and then I was in training to go to Korea in a top secret electronics thing in the in the Korean War, attending a church in uh, in Virginia, just outside uh, just outside of the Pentagon where I was stationed. And there was a retired judge that was now in the ministry preaching, and the enemy kept trying to tell me, "You can't talk," even though God had promised me the night He called me to preach. When I preach, I would never stammer like I do on this show. I don't do that when I preach. Okay, teaching a Bible study, yes. Carrying on a conversation, yes. Some days I can't carry on a whole sentence, but never one time in the pulpit in 60 years. God promised me that night. But the enemy was constantly battling. Are you sure you're called into the ministry? And I'll never forget the night that that judge, he was in his 70s, walked up to me and said, don't forget you're called into the ministry. Don't you ever forget it. And you know, God can use a word to encourage you, but this kind of stuff is garbage. This kind of stuff is not God. It's not from God. It's not of God. It actually makes a mockery of the true prophecy of God. There are a few true prophets around. I believe Jay Wilkerson was a true prophet. He, even he made mistakes sometimes. And uh, that's why the book of 1 Corinthians says to test the prophets to test the prophets. Don't forget in the Old Testament, the prophets were the true spokesmen for God. Well, now every Christian has a right to witness to Jesus Christ and tell people about his love and his grace. So every Christian is to be is to be God's prophetic. You are, you are God's prophetical voice for this day. Don't forget that. If you're a Christian, you are God's prophetical voice for this day. And he will anoint you and empower you to be that. I keep looking at the clock to make sure I don't, don't run over. How can I tell the difference when God is telling me no versus wait? It's very, very difficult. I'm not sure you always can. But, but with me, it's always been a flat no. It's always been a flat no. And a wait is kind of a uh, feeling. That's the only way I can tell. A wait is, yeah. But a no is, no, George, no. No, no, no. And uh, I mentioned before, on one of the programs that there was a man in another city that hated preachers and his wife was a great Christian and we'd go by the house to see the family. He'd run out the back door. He didn't have any use for preachers. And he came down with cancer of the throat and he was in the hospital. And I got a call one night from the, uh, from the hospital and they said, can you come? He's only got about 30 minutes to live. The, uh, 
and they told me the uh, the cancer in his throat had reached the main artery. Blood was gushing his mouth every time his heart would beat. He didn't have long, so I turned on my flashers, rushed through the city. I knew the police wouldn't stop me. They knew the they knew the cars of the local pastors. And I went through, got to the hospital, and he had water gushing, blood gushing out of his mouth. And I called him by name and I said, you need to accept the Lord. He said, I'm fine. I said, no, in about 15 minutes, you're going to drop into hell and burn forever. <laughs> the eyes of the doctors almost popped out of their head when I said that. And uh, I went on to, he said, you're right. And he prayed the sinner's prayer. And God spoke to me and said, I'm giving him six months. And so I prayed for him, and, and, and God said, pray the bleeding will stop. So I said, I command this bleeding to stop in Jesus' name, and it stopped. And then their eyes really popped out. And I went home and told Gene, God has given such and such six months. And uh, there were some prophecies came out in the church that he's going to live for many years, and I tell people, please don't pay any attention uh, to that particular one. And I didn't tell them why. Six months to the day, God took that man home. And I kept praying for God to heal him. And God said, no, I told you six months. God made it very clear. He gave him six months. But during that six months, he became so sweet. He was almost sicky sweet. And God could see the change in his life in that six months. And that six months affected a lot of lives. But God will give you a definite no. Give you a definite no. Do you recommend sending kids to public or private school? In the, the stuff that is being taught today, I would... if all possible send them to a Christian school. I would all possible do that uh, as long as it's a good, solid Christian school and not filled with legalism and that kind of stuff. But a, but there's so much garbage. A child Asking a child if they want to be a boy or a girl, hey, they are a boy or a girl, okay? They are a boy or a girl. And just a lot of stuff being taught in our public schools today. It's always been bad, but it's worse now than ever. But there's a lot of good Christian teachers in public schools. A lot of good Christian teachers in public schools. And so it depends on your school situation and, and the particular thing. What is the biblical or Christian response to the power of positive thinking? Is Jesus the master of positive thinking? No. Uh, he called things wrong that were wrong. Po positive thinking, just the idea of not admitting something's wrong, but but he called false religion, false religion. Jesus was very plain. Uh, you can go overboard on it. It's good to have positive, good to have positive comments. But just to say, I feel sick, doesn't mean you're going to get sick. You no, know, they take the phrase where Job said, the thing I've most greatly feared has come upon me, that that's why it happened to him. No, you read the book of Job, that's not why it happened to him. It's just because God put Job on display. And it wasn't because it happened to him. They talk about making a bad confession. No, that's got nothing to do with that. And so uh, a positive thought can be go overboard. If you've got the flu, you've got the flu. And it's not a bad confession to say, I have the flu. But I would say, I believe God's going to take me through this and heal me. And so uh, it, it, you can overdo any truth. Why did God appear to Moses on multiple occasions and yet very few or maybe no one else was allowed to see his face because Moses was organizing the people of God. He was getting the books of Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. He had to sit and write all of those. The other people didn't need to see God. They saw what they needed to see. Moses was the leader. God put authority in that leader to follow that leadership and to follow him as he followed the Lord. And he had so much he was doing with his life. It took appearance after appearance after appearance after appearance. Imagine writing Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. And uh, just a fantastic thing. And then explaining it to the people and preaching to the people and rebuking the false believers and being the battles he went through. Read the book of Numbers about the battles that he went through and the agony that he went through. How could Moses record his own death? Well, he didn't. It had to be a scribe, obviously. It had to be a scribe, obviously, that recorded his death, okay? What does Hebrews 2, 5 mean? For it's not put the world to come of which we speak in subjection to angels. What does it say about the world at the time of the passage was written? Was the world in subjection to angels at that time? Does it mean that we should not expect to find angels today? 
or if we don't find angels today, that mean that the angels didn't change over. No, it's really got nothing to do with finding angels today or not finding angels today. Uh, the book of Hebrews chapter 2. Uh, in the book of Hebrews, the author compares Jesus with a whole lot of things. For instance, he starts out by comparing him with the prophets and shows that they are greater than the prophets because he's the ultimate revelation of God. Then he shows how great angels are and shows Jesus is greater than the angels because he created the angels. And then he's going to show that Jesus is greater than Adam. And you have to read the whole passage. That's the danger about taking one phrase out of context. One in a certain place. Now, it's quoting from the eighth Psalm. And this is Hebrews chapter 2, verse 6. One in a certain place, what is man that you're mindful of him, or the son of man that you take care of him? You made him for a short time lower than the angels, okay? You crowned him with glory and honor. Man was made in the image of God, Adam, and you set him over the work of your hands. God put everything under Adam. Read the book of Genesis. You have put all things in subjection under his hand. And that he put all things in subjection, he left nothing that is not put under him. Okay. And he starts out the whole phrase that you quoted. Under the angels, he has not put a subjection yea, to come wherever we speak. He goes on to indicate that God put everything in subjection under Adam. All right. But he's showing Jesus is greater than Adam. But we don't see all things under him. What happened? We know that sin came. But we see Jesus who was made for a short time lower than the angels. Why? So he could die. He became a man so he could die. He was lower the angels in that sense that it was possible now for him to die. For the suffering of death crowned with glory and honor that he by the grace of God should taste death for every man. So you've got to take verse five all the way down through verse 13. All the way down through verse 13. So the basic thing is, Jesus is going to be in control of everything, that God originally put everything in control under Adam. Adam lost it, but now it's going to be restored under Jesus. And he, by the grace of God, tasted death for every man. Okay? Got five more minutes, okay? Uh, let me mention my book on Revelation. I haven't talked about it. I didn't mention it at all last week. And there's we had, had a lot of questions connected with it tonight. My book of Revelation uh, says the end and completion of the story, chapter 66, the revelation of Jesus Christ simply explained. Now, those of you that are new to the broadcast, you don't know me yet, but I've, but I've taught the book of Revelation in seminaries and Bible colleges for the last 30 years around the world. I've taught Bible prophecy seminars for the past 40 years. I've had the privilege of teaching the whole Bible college level, taught New Testament Greek for 25 years. And a number of years ago, back in the late 90s, I wrote a book for Global University, a textbook that's used in over 80 countries of the world in Bible colleges, but that was a textbook. I had to examine all the different viewpoints, all the different ideas about the book of Revelation. Well, this is the way I see the book of Revelation and the way I teach it after having studied it for over 60 years. And I put like the prophecy of Matthew 24 that I read tonight where it fits into the book of Revelation. I take First and Second Thessalonians where they fit into the book of Revelation. I take the book of Daniel where it fits into the various parts of the book of Revelation, not as a separate book. And I take all 20 two chapters of the book of Revelation in order and apply the prophetic scriptures that fit to that particular chapter. And I tried to keep it simple. Try to keep it simple. I use simple language. I remind preachers that Jesus used eighth grade language. Now, since I taught Greek, I do use Greek words, but I explain every one when I do use them. And I guarantee you study this book. When you're finished with it, you will understand the book of Revelation. I explain the principles for interpreting this type of Bible. I'm like, when I go overseas, the three primary classes that are requested for me are Revelation, Romans and Galatians, and also hermeneutics, how to interpret scripture. And I, and again, I've been doing that for over 30 years now. And I do two-week intensives for pastor when I travel. So I explain how to interpret what's called apocalyptic literature, which is what the book of Revelation is. It's a picture book.
And one of the things is the Bible is its own best interpreter. Every picture in the book of Revelation is either interpreted in the book of Revelation itself or somewhere else in scripture. And it makes total, complete sense. It's very understandable. It's available from eBay. And you can look for chapter 66 because there's 66 books in the Bible. And this is the last chapter. And by George Westlake, W-E-S-T-L-A-K-E. If you like to send your questions in ahead of time for the program, you can address it to D-R-G-W-W-J-R for Dr. George W. Westlake, Jr., drgwwjr at gmail.com. And we still got a few questions left. We'll get to these next week. And so you can send your questions in or you can write them in live while we're on the air. But the book again, chapter 66. Now, if you like to order things by item number, it's a very long number. If you got a pen, I'll give it to you a couple of times. It's 36266412. 6992 on eBay. 36266412 or chapter 66 by George W. Westlake Jr. And we try to send them out the day after we get the order. And uh, I got an order this week from a church that apparently the pastor read it and ordered 35 more. They're going to be doing a Bible study on it. And I guarantee you'll understand the book of Revelation. There's 26 pictures of Jesus in the book. The real name of the book is the Revelation of Jesus Christ. There's 26 distinct pictures of Jesus in the book of Revelation. And I've read between 150 and 200 books on Bible prophecy. And Bible prophecy is taking place. I make no apologies. There is going to be a rapture of the church. It will be sudden without warning. You cannot set dates. Jesus said it's not for you to know. Speaking of that event, and when Jesus said it's not for you to know, what does that mean? It's not for you to know. You're not going to figure it out by the Jewish calendar. You're not going to figure it out by the sun and the moon and stars. It's going to be without warning as a thief in the night. It's going to begin. Then it's a whole series of events that happen. God bless you. Thank you for tuning in. Have a great week in Jesus Christ.